Hi, everybody. My name is Neil Seidman, and I'm co-chair of the Public Education Committee for ADAA. That's the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. So welcome to our webinar, Building Resilience, How Families Can Prepare for the Uncertain School Year Ahead. And our presenters are Dr. Mary Alvord. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Alvord. Thank you. Dr. Beth Salcedo. Thank you, Dr. Salcedo, for joining us. And Dr. Dana Kornfeld. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. This webinar is co-sponsored by the Anxiety and Depression Association of America and Resilience across borders. So ADAA is the leading nonprofit organization in the field of anxiety and depression. Our mission is to improve diagnosis and prom promote the prevention, treatment, and cure of anxiety, depression, and stress-related disorders. And resilience across borders is dedicated to increasing access to mental health interventions for all children and adolescents. Our research-based method helps youth build resilience so they can adapt to life's challenges now and throughout their lives. If you have a question after watching the webinar, you can send an email to webinars at adaa.org. Now for our live audience, take just a moment to find the Q&A link so you can type in a question for our panel. If you're on a laptop, you can look at the bottom of your screen near the center. If you're on a smartphone and you tap anywhere on your screen, you should see a menu at the bottom of your screen with a Q&A link. So feel free to type in your question. Now, if we don't get to your question, because we have quite a large audience uh, on our live uh, presentation, we'll do our best to address your question on the adaa.org website. Now, for our audience watching the recording, again, you can email your question to a webinars at adaa.org. Now, just a quick disclaimer. We'll be talking about strategies for coping and building resilience. We're not going to be able to offer medical advice about COVID-19. So I'm really happy to just do a brief introduction of our presenters. Mary Kay Alvord, PhD, is a psychologist with more than 40 years of clinical experience. She's founder and president of resilience across borders. Dr. Alvord has published articles and chapters on resilience and stress over the past 20 years. And she's co-authored two books, Conquer Negative Thinking for Teens and Resilience Builder Program for Children and Adolescents. Dr. Dana Kornfeld, MD, is a pediatrician and adolescent medicine specialist. She's at the Pediatric Care Center in Bethesda, Maryland. She has over 25 years of clinical experience with a special interest in the emotional and developmental issues of children and adolescents. Dr. Kornfeld graduated from the University of Pennsylvania Medical School and completed her medical training at the Children's National Medical Center in Washington, DC. And finally, uh, Beth Salcedo, MD, is an adult psychiatrist and the medical director of the Ross Center, which has offices in Washington, DC, New York City, and Northern Virginia. Dr. Salcedo serves as the past president of ADAA, where she's been an active board member for many years. And Dr. Salcedo is a distinguished fellow with the American Psychiatric Association. So thank you all for joining us. 
Um, before we get started, we'd like to just to do a quick instant poll uh, for our audience, our live audience. How do you feel about the upcoming school year? Anxious, excited, unsure, a little bit of everything. And you could uh, click in your or tap in your, your answer. It'd be fun to see what people have to say. So let me turn things over now to Dr. Alvord. Thank you. And then I guess we'll have the results coming up soon of the poll. So that'll be interesting. Um, mine is still showing on my screen, so I will just cancel that out now. Thank you all. And uh, thanks so much. There are the results. I think everybody can see them. So let's see. Most people say a little bit about everything. Mm -hmm. right? A little bit of everything. And a lot, of, a lot of anxiety and a lot of uncertainty. Right, right. And a certain amount of excitement mixed into that, you know, into that mixture, which we really want to have the excitement come up a little bit more and some of the anxiety and the difficulty with uncertainty down. But that will be a, a challenge for all of us this upcoming year. So I'm thrilled to be here. Um, as Neil so graciously said, I founded the, uh, the nonprofit called Resilience Across Borders. And our mission really is to decrease barriers to mental health access. And Drs. Kornfeld and Salcedo are also part of the board of direction, the directors. So I have been intrigued with resilience for many years, starting probably because of my immigrant parents and uh, I didn't speak English growing up at home. And so had to acclimate in a, in a different way and understand all the struggles that they had to surmount and yet come ahead. And then uh, in the early nineties, many children were adopted from Russia and because I spoke Russian was worked a lot with that population and saw the strengths and as well as the adversity. So, you know, what is resilience? Resilience is really the, the ability to adapt uh, not only to hardships and adversities and traumas, which that was the original research uh, was those very severe, but as a clinician all these years, uh, I've noted that what mostly we deal with are the everyday challenges and the challenges for kids, ADHD, anxiety, you know, peer relationships, uh, school difficulties, learning differences, you know, all of the above. And so learning the skills of resilience is really critical for, for everybody. And we all are resilient to a certain extent but what we wanna do is build it more. And so what I do is a little demo to demonstrate this. And I just say, you know, resilience and stress is very much like the rubber band. And as we get more stressed and stressed and stressed, right? The rubber band stretches, but we don't want it to snap. So we need to come up with various coping strategies, problem solving, connecting with others, knowing that we're not alone, you know, learning to calm ourselves until we get, get back to sort of the normal stress because there's always a little bit of stress. And when we are normal stressed, we're able to think flexibly. And we know that underlying mental wellness is the ability to, to think about multiple solutions to difficulties, and also just different perspectives on the same thing. A uh, key to resilience is also being proactive because proactive means, you know, proacting, taking some good action, facing fears. We know with anxiety treatment, that's what we do. We face the fears uh, because otherwise they build in our heads and get worse and worse. We also learn to uh, take initiative, which is huge because we wanna be the opposite of feeling helpless. When we feel helpless, 
we also feel like we're victims. And then we tend to feel more hopeless, which really then tends to the depressive end of things. So being proactive is kind of a key cornerstone. The other is making connections uh, with family, with friends, uh, particularly for kids. If they have at least one child that is a good buddy, that's really somebody just enough. You don't need a large group, just like with adults. We don't need large groups of people, but we do need our small community. And self-regulating. Self-regulating means both in terms of learning ways to calm our bodies, either through deep belly breathing, as opposed to rapid chest breathing, learning how to relax our muscles and even recognize when the muscles are tense versus when they're relaxed. And, um, and thinking, the thinking is really critical. The, the thought patterns that we have, we can challenge them. So part of self-regulation is thinking instead, this is too hard, saying, you know, I've done this before, uh, I can put some more effort into it, or I can else ask someone for help. So actually asking others for help is part of being resilient and no. And I also use a little dartboard and talk about, you know, on, on target thinking in the middle. So if it's, I failed and I'll never do well, that's sort of maybe even way off the, the dartboard. And here in the middle is like, I'm really gonna fail this class on the mark is, you know, I may, maybe I didn't do well, we all make mistakes, I'm just gonna work harder. And in the scheme of things, it's one thing happening in my life, it's not everything. So it's that overall perspective. The other part of resilience is community. <clears throat> and that's where school systems and, uh, and our own networking becomes so absolutely critical. And finding that appropriate school for your child that, that has the resources, if your child has any particular needs. And then uh, community, faith communities can be very supportive. Wh whatever your community, knowing that you're not alone is the key. Um, and proactive parenting means high expectations, but realistic expectations with a lot of warmth and, and understanding. Uh, the other thing is knowing skills and talents beyond just the kind of the obvious. And so many kids do struggle with academic areas and really building up for all of us, not just for our children and the students that we work with, but what are the islands of competence? It might be creative arts, it might be theater, it might be sports, it might be math, it might be history, you know, it might be um, outdoor hiking and what, whatever it may be is cultivate that. So there- But maybe build on what the child is already good at. Exactly, I mean, and, and so that, thank you for that comment because resilience is really building on our assets and the focus is how do we build as opposed to just how do we deal with our deficits? So in the big picture, can resilience have also payoffs in terms of how well kids do in school? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we actually have done some research in, in the schools that we've worked with and we have found that not only did kids improve their sense of sort of self-mastery and their ability to take charge? But we were we never we didn't target this directly, but academic motivation increased and classroom engagement, uh, as well as study skills. Who would know? But right, it it makes sense because if you have more brain space, so to speak, to um, to feel better and you have friends and you're just more relaxed and coping as you go, then you're more engaged in whatever you do and motivated to do it.
Well, you gave to such such a wonderful introduction <clears throat> just now, <clears throat> excuse me, to the idea of resilience. Uh, just a wealth of resources. And you talked about social connection and how just a child having just one good friend. And then you talked about connection in the community as one aspect of resilience. And then you introduced the idea of self-regulation. Uh, maybe we'll get an idea in our webinar here about how can I relax my body a little bit? And then you talked about uh, relating to our thinking. And I love that uh, target. <laughs> can, I, can I choose thoughts or maybe move child towards care, thoughts that might right? be more helpful? Right, <laughs> right, very good. Wonderful introduction, thank you. Thank you. And we will, we will leave and talk about these, these things. I just wanna say, and this webinar is a community, right? Just joining this, we all are part of the, the greater struggles that we're facing this this coming year uh, with all the range of emotions that come with it. And I think uh, Dr. Kornfeld, I'll introduce you and um, let you speak a little bit from your perspective as a pediatrician. Thank you. And it's absolutely wonderful to be here with a large group of parents. I as a pediatrician, I spend my entire day with families and each day I'm really uplifted and humbled by the incredible amount of love that comes through my door. And with that love um, comes worry and fear. Um, parents wanna protect their kids. Um, they wanna protect them from pain and illness, from fear, from uncertainty. And as parents, we've always had to figure out that balance of keeping our kids safe, but not letting our own fears prevent them from taking healthy, enriching and growth inspiring risks. We know that independence and exploration and healthy risk taking embolden our children and um, help them to overcome, um, you know, fears and become more self-sufficient, confident, and more resilient. So how do we balance that? If I'm a parent, keeping my kids safe and encouraging their growth and independence. Yeah, and especially at this point now, we're all facing so much uncertainty. You know, how can we have that uncertainty and, and not go to these worst case scenarios and make fear-based decisions that kind of limit our children's growth. And I do have some strategies. And um, one of those strategies is, is limiting media consumption um, and trying to just tap into short sessions to get essential facts because we know that excessive um, media um, consumption drives our irrational fears and escalates our sensation of risk. Um, and limiting- Do you have a specific suggestion if I'm a parent, uh, what I might try as far as limiting my news media and maybe how about exposure for my kids too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's really important to choose a few trusted individuals and maybe at the end we can talk about, you know, who those people might be in our community. I mean, other than your pediatrician or internist who's, you know, can hopefully help synthesize some of the news and make, you know, kind of uh, present the facts on the ground, as opposed to sort of getting um, sort of into this whirlwind of media where, um, you know, our fears are being ignited and driven. And um, so I think, you know, trying to really just not be tapped into media all day long, but be tapping into, you know, your life, your children, your friends, your family, your community, and really just what do I need to know today or this week about, you know, the vaccines or the health risks or what's happening in schools, as opposed to just getting caught up in, um, you know, sort of uh, overdrive, emotional overdrive, and being bombarded with media that, you know, sometimes we we know that just uh, is is meant to 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 glue us to the television as opposed to really give us facts that are helpful. Um, 
So yes, um, you know, I think that helps us stay in what we would call realistic thinking, which is, you know, empowering and solution driven um, and avoid sort of catastrophic thinking, which really fuels anxiety and hampers our ability to make good decisions for our kids. Um, as Mary talked about, connection also really builds um, resilience. And I think one of the things I think is so important as a pediatrician is engaging in active listening with our children. Um, and this means sitting and listening to our children without letting our own anxiety overtake us without necessarily trying to fix things, but listening to how they feel, um, not trying to stamp out their pain, but validating their pain and accepting that pain is, you know, a part of life and um, helping our children learn to manage pain is, you know. So allowing my child to, to feel what they feel instead of saying, don't be afraid, <laughs> but to actually let them talk about whatever they're feeling. Is that an important part of the resilience that we're talking about here? Yes, absolutely. Because I think being present in the moment and hearing kids not, you know, sort of whitewashing things, everything's going to be okay. I mean, kids are smart. They, they know that this is a tough situation. And I think just really being open and responsive and hearing how people feel um, is just, you know, allows people to feel connection and to feel heard. And we know that this kind of connection and um, feeling her um, really is important for resilience. I think that was maybe the first point that Dr. Alvord made about resilience is the importance of connection. Yeah. So if I'm talking about if I'm an anxious child or an anxious parent, and I'm talking about my feelings to someone who's I'm feeling connected with, someone who's just listening and acknowledging me. So a parent can do that with their child. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we love our children so much. We want to take their pain away. So it's, a, it's a natural inclination to just reassure. But we know that reassurance um, does not build resilience. What builds resilience is feeling your feelings and having your feelings validated um, and, you know, really connecting honestly. Um, and just a few other things. I think, um, you know, Mary mentioned uh, Spending time in nature is very healing, especially during this um, pandemic. I think, you know, getting out, being in beautiful places, um, feeling your body, exercising, um, you know, having rituals that sort of sanctify time for our family, whether it's just having dinner together every night or talking before bed or playing games, or I've had families that have, you know, had like dance sessions together where they're kind of moving around and listening to music. So any type of ritual or celebration um, that, you know, uh, makes life feel meaningful to you and your family is um, really important at this time. Dr. Karnfeld, how important is, is just physical movement to resilience, moving the body, exercise, dance? Yeah, I think it's incredibly important. I think we all know that, you know, and during this pandemic, many of us have, you know, had a sense of listlessness and you know lethargy where it's been hard to to get up and move and i think many of our kids have felt that and we also have to understand that and not always push push but also you know take a moment to validate how hard it is sometimes when you're feeling overwhelm or sadness to get up and move and actually you know, motivate yourself. But I do think if we can find ways to get our families up and out and moving and be in pretty places and, you know, look at the flowers and look at the leaves changing and get it, you know, just being in nature and moving our bodies, I think it really is quite healing. Um, and then the, the other point I wanted to make is that, you know, our culture is sort of, uh, has this huge emphasis on perfection. Um, and I think that as parents, 
we need to try not to catastrophize our children's mistakes or our mistakes, but really to look at them as opportunities to learn. Um, life is inherently messy and difficult. And, you know, I sometimes have families come and say, oh my gosh, you know, why is my family having this problem and that problem and that problem? And I say, well, so is that family next door and the family right in the room next door to that one. Um, we all need to accept that life is very imperfect and messy. And I think that that, you know, sort of taking that in really builds um, resilience. Um, and then the other point, you know, this past year, we felt stressors as never before, but I think there were times over the past year where we, we all felt this sort of sense of relief. And I've been hearing a lot from children of many ages, especially, you know, 10th, 11th and 12th graders, like this reprieve from the fast paced um, intensity and stress of life. And, you know, I hope that we all sort of gather some data from that and it informs some of our decisions in this coming year. Um, because um, yeah, life has been very intense for our children. The pandemic obviously has, you know, added an extra layer of intensity, but you know, anxiety and depression and panic and um, fears, you know, they came before the pandemic. And um, I think just acknowledging what we have learned, how we all sort of have taken some solace in the quiet of this time. Um, I think that's kind of uh, an important take home message. So we might um, have some lessons from this last year that could add to our resilience. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, you know, I, I think just sort of in sum, collecting COVID information in a careful way, speaking to people you trust, trying to stay in your rational brain, um, practicing self-compassion, and, um, and then through it all, my favorite child rearing mantra is this too shall pass. Um, <laughs> from your baby screaming all night long to uh, this pandemic. So hope that. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, Dr. Salcedo, would you like to? I will add a few things. Yes. I also uh, have this too shall pass as one of my talking points because I think it's important for us to remember that um, we need to keep up the hope. Um, but I, I really wanted to start by reminding everybody, not just parents, but anybody that deals with families and kids, whether as a caregiver or as an educator, that we are always navigating risk and fear and worry. And we're always being flexible and adapting. Um, every day with a kid in any capacity is a challenge, a different challenge. Every kid is a different kid. And there's really a surprise around every corner. So we don't really have a choice but to adapt. And so we've practiced the skills that we need to be resilient in times of stress. It's just on a very different level now. But I think that there are skills that we can all hone. Um, and so I'm going to focus on just a few. Um, and I, and I want to emphasize that these are skills that for most of us, we have to practice them. It's not a one and done. It's not a riding a bike and you can always hop back on and, and, and get something like exercise that really needs to be a practice. Um, I think practicing accepting uncertainty is incredibly important. Um, all of the information that we're getting right now is changing very fast. Um, and all we want as human beings and certainly as parents is to have the absolute right answer for how we keep ourselves and our families safe. And we don't have that. Um, but again, I think we need to remember that we deal with these kinds of uncertainties every day. Every day you put your kid in a car, you know, you're, you're practicing you know, good, um, safe driving. You put them in a seat belt, but you know there's a risk and you balance the, the, the risks and the benefits of using that car to get to whatever activity you're getting to. Um, but you always know that there's a really high likelihood of getting there safely. And so every day you're practicing um, accepting uncertainty and we need to use those same skills right now. And um, there are plenty of other times in our lives where we've needed to do this. 
um, and needed to have that flexibility of thinking that Dr. Alvord referred to, um, you know, that, that really does lead to good mental wellness. But this has to be for many of us a real practice. So Dr. Um, Salcedo, uh, what I'm hearing you say is that if I'm a parent and, and I wanna protect my kid in the pandemic, instead of trying to get 100% certain, and I don't know how am I gonna do that, read more articles. <laughs> you're not, yeah. <laughs> instead to do what you're saying, to uh, practice allowing, doing the best I can and practicing allowing for the uncertainty that's, that's gonna be there in every situation. And I think just trying to, to know that if you put all of the right things in place, like when you're driving a car, you go the speed limit, you follow the signals, you put your seatbelt on, most likely things are gonna go well for you. And so we have to remind ourselves of that because I think it's very easy for us to get, lose our perspective in a situation like we have right now with this pandemic. So is it normal to feel some level of stress and anxiety? So I was gonna say that if you're not feeling some level of fear or worry or discomfort right now, that's to me, that's the abnormal. <laughs> um, and not to mention grief after everything we've all gone through. You know, there have been big losses, loss of life and health and financial security, and a ton of little losses. You know, the loss of the last game with your beloved soccer team or whatever it is. And so feeling those feelings and accepting them and validating them for yourself and for other people, I think is really, really important. And we have to accept them and again, feel and process them versus fighting against them. Um, I think we have to be very careful to pay close attention to when those feelings start to become worries and sort of an unproductive response of worrying and ruminating versus, you know, accepting the feelings and kind of letting them go. So, you know, it's one thing to spend time thinking about your options and creating a plan for return to school and activities, et cetera. And that can be really fruitful, productive time. But if you start to worry and ruminate over whether everyone is safe when the plan is in place, that's really going to get you nowhere except exhaust you and leave you feeling spent. Um, I think some people worry because it gives them a sense of control, but um, the fallout from that worry can be really more than it's, than it's worth. So people really need to try to step back and notice that they're worried or that they're worrying, um, kind of observe those worries and know that they're, they're feelings and they don't, they're, not, they're not making them up, um, you know, that they're valid and they're real, but don't let them suck you in. Don't buy into the feelings. So try as much as you can to distance yourself and let them go. It's not the, the thought that's really bad, it's the holding on to uh, the thought and kind of going down that spiral rabbit hole of worry that then causes you to suffer. And you know, you're know you exhausted, you're spent, you're irritable, you're not the parent or partner, spouse, caregiver that you wanna be. And then, um, you know, uh, I think Dr. Kornfeld and Dr. Alvord mentioned a lot of these things, but modeling for your kids, um, you know, sometimes it's a fake it till you make it kind of thing. If you, if you model positivity for your kids, you're actually spending time in the positive versus the negative. So modeling these things for your kids can, can be a benefit, of course, to them, but also to you. Um, so be realistic and keep things in perspective, but um, try to focus as much as possible as you can on the positivity, on the things that we have to be grateful for. That I think sounds cliche to people, but I really do believe if you spend a little bit of time every day with gratitude, that can make a difference in your overall mental well-being. Um, and then really, really important, I think, is compassion because um, we, we really hold ourselves often to a much higher standard than we hold our best friend or our spouse, partner, other adult human beings. And, you know, we're, we're not responsible for predicting the future. We're not responsible for things that are out of our control. And we are human and we can easily get caught up in all of this stuff. Once you see yourself getting caught up, though, it's time to take some action and really, again, try to distance yourself from um, the negative ruminative worry. Um, but talking to yourself like you would talk to a close friend versus saying, you know, oh, I should have done this or I should have done that or what if I had done that? That's not, again, not productive. 
Um, so, so seeking seeking perfection maybe is not the greatest uh, agenda. Yeah. So Instead, complete. some self compassion. Yes. And exactly. you were talking about being a good role model for our children. And a question just came in. Uh, sounds, it looks like a really great question. It's not saying the age of the child, but the question from the parent is, is it okay to cry in front of my child? Is it okay to show my emotions? Yes. And it's great modeling for them because they're going to have those same emotions, if not now, when. And they need to know that it's okay to feel it. And it's okay to emote and that it will, again, as Dr. Cornfield said, it will pass, you know? So I'm, I'm gonna say one other thing, which is that um, I think structure is incredibly important, not just for your family, but for, for yourself and having structured time where you exercise, structuring your sleep and your kids sleep and all of the family rituals it's really important for us, for our own resilience, but it also is such a comfort to our kids who often can feel helpless and out of control. So I think making that a real priority, it's, it's simple. It's not always easy, but it's pretty simple and it's doable for everybody. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that if you have a lot of anxiety, you should think about whether it makes sense to get it treated. Um, our kids can inherit anxiety from, from their parents. Um, there's a biological or a, and or a genetic predisposition that they can inherit. And um, there's also some learned behavior that they can learn growing up with an anxious parent. And so there's not a lot we can do about what they inherit and there's no point in anyone beating themselves up or feeling guilty about that piece. But I think you can control what you show them and how you respond to your anxiety. So I think if it occurs to you that anxiety might be impacting, you know, one or more areas of your life, it's making you less of a the parent that you want to be or less of the partner or professional that you want to be, then you should think about looking into various treatments for anxiety. There's a lot out there. There's some plenty of self-help stuff that you can do, including learning to meditate, practicing mindfulness, and there are a lot of good evidence-based psychotherapies out there as well. Um, available now, you know, a little easier for people because of remote work. Um, but it's important that, that you know what kind of psychotherapy um, you're looking for. And then even going toward the medication route if that's necessary. They're all valid ways of, of treating anxiety. So if you, if you think you should treat it, you should definitely at least educate yourself about treatment and maybe have a consultation with that. A professional. Yeah, if I'm a parent and I'm and I'm I know I'm having difficulties with anxiety, but say I've never sought help for myself before, mm -hmm. and I go on to the ADAA.org website and click on find a therapist, but I'm not ready to, to do it quite yet. How big of a commitment is that? Is it okay? I mean, is it going to be okay if I say I just want a couple of sessions to learn some tools, or am I signing up for some long-term treatment? So, you know, you can always dip your toe in the water. You could meet with a therapist and get their opinion on whether you really need to be in therapy. Um, I think, you know, we think of cognitive behavioral therapy as the gold standard psychotherapy for anxiety. And um, I think it's, you know, it's a short term uh, treatment. It's usually 12 to 16 sessions and typically delivered weekly. But sometimes people will go for a session or two and, and get a little bit out of it. And, you know, they can supplement with some online skills and tools, or like I said, you know, meditation, certainly exercise and good self-care. So it's, it's not really a commitment. Um, you know, if you sign up and you feel like you've gotten what you need after a couple of sessions, you can stop and you can always go back. And, and the value uh, can be, I can get some one-on-one -on -one help. Yeah, specific. To yeah, versus. instead of me trying to navigate it and find the mm -hmm. tools on, just on my own. Mm -hmm. And I would say one-on-one, -on -one pers the perspective. Because sometimes when we say things out loud, we're actually like, oh yeah, okay, I'm hearing myself now. Whereas when it's in our head, it tends to, sort of blow up and get distorted. Um, so often for, you know, most people talking something out is helpful. 
But again, you want, you want really therapies that are evidence-based um, and there are a lot of workbooks available too, just making sure that they're evidence-based. Uh, here's a question uh, that I could pose to the whole panel. Uh, when do I know if my child might need some uh, therapy or medication for a mental health issue? Dana, do you want to take it? Because I think you're often in the front line and <laughs> yeah. refer to us. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think that there are some times when kids actually will overtly say to a parent, I would like some help. And I think if a child or an adolescent is, is actually asking for that, you know, that's, that's always something that should, should be looked at. Um, but sometimes, you know, kids don't know, they're just suffering. And, um, and I think, you know, an important place that one can start is with your trusted pediatrician who's known your family for a long time to talk to your child and evaluate. Um, but I think that there are certain sort of, you know, things to look at, like, is my child actually showing signs of depression, becoming more reclusive, um, not being as interested in activities that they were interested in before. Sometimes sleep can be affected or appetite can be affected. Um, kids can often manifest with anxiety or depression with fatigue. They don't wanna get out of bed, they're sleeping too much, or sometimes they can have insomnia and, and can fall asleep. Um, but you know, if, if you see that their previous level of functioning is diminishing, that can be a sign that you need outside help. Um, or if there seems to be anxiety that really is sort of disabling. I mean, as we talked about, anxiety is sort of a normal part of life and we can learn how to cope with it with different strategies. Um, but when a child is experiencing so much anxiety that they are fearful to um, leave home or go to school or try something new or, um, you know, they're experiencing so much anxiety that they are, that's becoming a sadness or a depression um, from worry. Um, those are, those are a lot of the signs that, you know, that they may need more help than, you know, just you as a parent, obviously, you know, all the parents that are on this webinar are like <laughs> trying so hard to be the best possible parents for their children. But sometimes, you know, no matter what you're doing, you, you don't necessarily have the, the resources to be able to help your child. And sometimes children just need to speak to someone else because sometimes parents, children don't tell their parents everything because they don't wanna make their parents afraid that there's something, you know, that they're, you know, they don't wanna stress their parents out or they might feel some shame about what they're feeling. So um, I think, you know, starting with your pediatrician for, you know, an assessment um, or reaching out to your pediatrician for some resources of therapists in the area if you have any of these concerns. Here's a, a really good question. Say my child is really anxious about going to school. Is it a good idea for me to try to do homeschooling as a way of responding to that anxiety? I'll take that. We, we don't normally uh, want to reinforce avoidance. Avoidance is sort of the hallmark of, of anxiety, right? We don't want to do it. We would rather not face it. And then if parents start accommodating the fear, then that just makes the fear seem more real. And then you have to think. I mean, I think that homeschooling is a family decision on multiple levels. But if you're doing it because this child is afraid of entering school, then that probably is not the best uh, way to deal with that. And instead, what we do are small steps and exposures to entry to school. So, you know, now I'm working with some kids who haven't been in a school building for a year and a half. They don't know what it's going to be like, or they're even going to go from a transition elementary to middle or middle to high school. 
and they really don't know what to expect. So on top of, you know, they didn't have the normal orientations. So I suggest to parents <clears throat> take them to the school, even if the building is closed, walk around the building, you know, see, take the bus route, you know, as if you were on the bus, if, if you're taking, if you're a walker, then walk to the school, get a feel, and then see if you can enter the school building. And then try to get an anchor person, because another person who can really help with all this are the school counselors. Um, most schools have at least a part-time school counselor, a school social worker, or, or even a school nurse that then you can take these gradual steps so that then the child, maybe even more reluctant, still gets into the building, sits with somebody for a little while, and then slowly enters the classroom. So <clears throat> exposure therapy is really one of the strongest um, evidence-based strategies for anxiety treatment. And so whatever as a parent we make as a decision, I think we need to think about what are the advantages and disadvantages, but we certainly want to take into account um, not accommodating a fear and making that fear grow because it can start from avoiding school to then start avoiding social interactions to avoiding, you know, and bigger and so that your life gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's the risk. I so think the idea really of, sorry. sorry, go ahead, doctor. I was just going to add that, you know, some of, for some of the parents that I see, the idea of, of putting their kid in exposure therapy, like Dr. Alvord was referencing, is so anxiety provoking for them that they end up kind of accommodating the anxiety. So again, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to make sure that your own anxiety is where it needs to be. And this is why in situations like, like this, a family therapy component is often a part of the culture. We have a, a question that uh, I think Dr. Alvord already uh, addressed with this idea of small steps. Uh, my son is nine with ADHD and anxiety. How can I make going back to school easier on him? You know, uh, what I like to do is look at not just the diagnostic category, but what about how does the ADHD impact that makes school harder? How does the anxiety impact and make school harder and sort of scaffold going backwards? Because so many kids with ADHD have difficulty with executive function, organizational skills, and actually may want to avoid things that are hard. They're not lazy, but if it's hard, we all try to avoid things. So scaffolding the back, making sure that um, if they don't qualify for a 504 plan in a school, that they still get resources or any help that might might be beneficial. And then, you know, the 504 plan, can you 504 explain that? plan would be, sorry, uh, 504 plan is the, the federal laws require that if your child has any kind of um, need for accommodation, not necessarily special education, because that would be an individual education plan, but a 504 plan, often ADHD will fall under that. And it just helps the school team, meeting with a school team to guide what resources and uh, strategies might be beneficial for your child. So I often recommend for, for parents that they set up a meeting with the, with the school team, the teacher, but also perhaps a school counselor and um, maybe a learning specialist if there is one to really talk about you know, what we can do. And then the small steps of getting back into school. And it always helps to have a peer so that your child isn't alone. Um, and it also, all the basic that we sort of touched on, but sleep. I mean, that sleep routine needs to start happening a week or two before school start, you know, in a gradual small step. It's not like, oh, all of a sudden, you're getting up at nine every morning and now high school, you have to get up at six. It's, you know, 15 minute increments over a period of time because what we know is it also, it affects mood and anxiety uh, and it affects just clarity of thought. 
So having a, or, or developing and getting to a set sleep schedule right. for my kids. And is that important for myself also? Oh, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. For us as humans, we need to sleep and eat and take care of, you know, the, the body and the mind are very much connected. And so if we take care of one, we need to take care of the other and it can help how important is uh, some form of meditation practice for resilience? Talking about for the parents themselves or for our older kids. You know, I think that uh, there's a host of self-regulation techniques and meditation and mindfulness are part of uh, what I see as sort of a, a toolkit. And you'll see, we'll have another toolkit, but so that pe parents and children can really choose what fits with them at different times. But I think the nice thing about meditation is it makes you focus in the moment in a way that we often don't, you know, stop to smell the roses. Like how many times? Do we walk by things and not even notice them until somebody says, did you notice, you know, that flower bed has been ripped out and we're like, oh no, I didn't notice that. And so it allows us to really center ourselves. And I think that is the power of that. And so self-regulation is one of those core protective factors. How do you bring yourself down with young children? They don't all, always know that they're dysregulated because some of them don't even know what it feels like to just be still and be calm. And you don't always have to be still and calm to be relaxed, right? You can be active and, and running. So it's a mental and a physical thing, but it's nice to teach also, um, you know, the meditation, the mindfulness, progressive muscle relaxation is really an excellent, and you can Google it. There are a lot of, um, free resources on that, but it's basically teaching you the difference between your, when your muscles are really tense versus when they're relaxed. And as you learn to differentiate that feeling, you become more aware of when you are tensing, right? Because if you're, if you're stressed out, you're anxious, you're sad, you're grief struck, your body tenses. And so we want to learn how to just let that go. And it's, it's, it you know, takes about 10 to 15 minutes, but once you learn progressive muscle relaxation, you can do it just a few minutes at a time and really help relax the body. Uh, here's a real quick question. Uh, my son is six years old and uh, cries a lot over all sorts of things and sometimes has tantrums. Uh, could this be a sign of anxiety? Should I get some help for my six-year-old for symptoms like this? So I'll, I can start off with this one. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, developmentally, children will go through many stages and, you know, they might, kids go through some stages which are easier and then some stages which are harder where they're more dysregulated where they might be a little more anxious where they might cry more and they might have tantrums more and so some of that can just be sort of a stage or or um, a um, you know developmental phenomenon um, but again I think a good place to start is with your pediatrician to talk about um, the the temper tantrums and to, um, you know, get advice as to whether or not they're falling within a, a realm of what it seems developmentally appropriate for that age child. And then also for you as a parent to get some strategies to be able to deal with um, the temper tantrums, because sometimes there are ways in which we interact with our kids when they are dysregulated that can, you know, sort of propel and exacerbate things. And there's ways in which we can learn strategies to help our children kind of calm down and regulate. And so I think, you know, it always makes sense to start with your pediatrician 
um, and um, to see if there are some strategies before you, you know, actually move to um, a psychotherapist. So we just have a, a very few minutes. Uh, Dr. Alvord, would you like to uh, give us a few tips as we start to close our webinar? Yes, and uh, thank you. I, I love to have the concept of toolboxes <laughs> because I think for all of us, we need to uh, really have a lot of strategies. I will say, and I hadn't really mentioned this, our value system is important. So for each family, our cultural context, our beliefs and our values are really important to form for each family. You know, some of us have large families and everybody congregates and others have small families, others, you know, value hiking, others have uh, different beliefs that they wanna value. So I just wanna put that out there because there's not a one size fits all. It's, it's choosing the tools that work for you given your value system and your cultural and your maybe geographic context too, because you have to fit into that. Um, so I wanna highlight, you know, the mental flexibility is, is really key. And just keep thinking about that rubber band. When we can think about um, more than one way to deal with something and see things in a broader context, it just, it makes life easier for all of us. And, and we are the role models for our kids. It's not just what we say, it's really what we do. And do we choose different paths? Um, uncertainty is going to continue. So we, we are certain of uncertainty. <laughs> you know, we're gonna continue in it. And I've actually, um, you know, find ways for yourself. What I've been saying to kids is, what did you like about virtual schooling? What did you not like? What did you like about in-person and not like? Because it may be that you may be doing both this coming year. We just don't know what the school year is going to look like. So we want to sort of have them expect the uncertainty to a certain extent. Those are great questions for mental flexibility. Yeah. Wonderful. and. You know, focus on what you can control and what you can change. So even during this pandemic, kids were saying to me, well, I can control my attitude. Well, I can control, you know, what I do. And what are the positives? Uh, you know, we've talked about some silver linings. The younger kids said to me, you know, my parents aren't are around more and they're willing to play games with me more. You know, so more family time for many was a positive. For many, there was a huge stressor as parents were trying to work and balance and just felt completely overwhelmed with it. And you know, we had to problem solve in different ways. Um, we are all imperfect. We all make mistakes. I have this great slide, which I can't show you today, but it's a pencil with lots of erasers. And I say to kids, why do pencils have erasers? <laughs> because we all make mistakes. And why does my picture have so many erasers? Because we all make so many mistakes. You know, and that is the, what, what we need to do is when we make mistakes, acknowledge it, accept it, validate it, and then figure out how do we want to make a change if we want to make a change. Um, and so be, you know, as Dr. Salcedo said, the self-compassion is so important for adults, but it's also important for us to teach our kids so that they're not focusing on what's gone wrong or what mistakes they've made, but that life is a process and life is filled with imperfections. Um, and I know I have a minute, so I'll make it quick, but challenging catastrophic thinking, that's what we have seen this year. You know, catastrophic thinking is thinking the worst case scenario. And it's how do we change those what if thinkings? How likely are they? What are other possibilities? And for the kids and teens, I say, what would you tell your friend, you know, if they're catastrophizing this worst situation? Well, you wouldn't say, oh yeah, things are gonna be horrible. You'd probably say, okay, we can figure out together how to make things better. And listen to your child, validate, you know, their feelings and their thoughts and, and know that then you can work together if you're at least validating, uh, 
to move to the next step and practice gratitude so important and the research supports it and remember we're all in this together <coughs> on that note um, <laughs> thank you very much i don't know neil it's we're hit the hour yeah so thank you so much dr alvor dr kornfeld dr salcedo uh thanks everybody for watching Feel free to email your questions to webinars at adaa.org. Uh, and we want to invite uh, everybody to go to adaa.org to find out about upcoming webinars and to make a charitable donation to support our mission and help us provide educational webinars like this one. So thanks again to our panel. Thank you for joining us and helping us with all these wonderful tools. And thanks everybody for watching and we'll see you next time. Thanks for taking the time out of your day, everyone. Yes, thank you everybody. <laughs>